Valley. Part of this spectacular city and the scenery we've all enjoyed for the last few days. Tonight, Milan, Italy is the centerpiece for Bellator MMA. As we move inside the Allianz Cloud, a building with a lot of history of its own. We're going to make our own a little bit later on tonight in a fascinating main event between the Bellator stalwart Adam Piccolotti and a newcomer and one of the biggest mysteries in European MMA, the big time free agent signing, Mansoor Barnawi. That is the end of the night when we go live on Showtime. Coming up after these prelims in a couple of hours, a lot of eyes are going to be on this co-main event as Fabian Edwards maybe try to repeat the history that his brother made last year as his eyes on a world title shot. He might be able to get it with an impressive victory over Charlie Ward. So Rogers and Tim Wilde, they have circled each other for nearly a decade in the UK tonight. They will finally meet. And Justin Gonzalez, a fast rising featherweight, looking at another big name, big European name, to his resume. But we begin with a pretty deep group of prelims with some fighters you are probably very familiar with, including some potential contenders. But it begins with an undefeated prospect at Bantamweight facing the most veteran test of his career. And now we welcome our first fighter to the cage, Jose. No chance. Maria Tom. Mowgli Hamidro. On the other end of the scale, an <laughs> undefeated fighter, still very young at 25 years old. And we said this a million times in MMA, you don't know what you don't know until you face the real test. It's hard to gauge it on the feature fight. It is, and when you take a look at the competition that coming off his face, he's faced some good competition, but nothing that has been of the level of the people that Tomei has fought. But this guy's wrestling is outstanding. His jujitsu is good, he gets to the top position fast, he does a lot of damage on the ground, but he's facing a black belt, a guy that's been there before. This might be a different experience. The contrast will pop off the screen in the tail of the tape. As simple as it gets, you're looking at it. Age is a big difference, but 13 and 0, undefeated record going against a incredibly experienced 40 and 9. Our night begins as it always does with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Allianz Cloud Arena here in Milano, Italia. As we get set now to kick off the Bellator 287 prelims with three five-minute rounds in the bantamweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot five, weighing in 135.6 pounds. The veteran enters tonight with 40 professional victories, nine defeats from Alto Santo Sierra Brazil. Presenting Jose No Chance, Maria Tome. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 135.8 pounds. As a professional, he's undefeated at 13 and 0 from Dushanbe, Tajikistan. Introducing Sarvajan Mogli Hamidov. And the referee in charge, Michael Bell. Sarvajan, back over there, brother. 
Find someone that loves you the way Michael C. Williams loves to say Guys, towns in Brazil. <laughs> All right. You ready, Jose? Ready, Zero? Let's go! How long does it take a young fighter to realize he's in with someone who has got a lot more experience? You know what you really, the things that you find out is have a guy that's got a lot of experience you go up against him for the first time and he'll pull little tricks that you go i shouldn't have gotten by that i shouldn't have been hit by that and then the last thing is sometimes you'll hit them and they just kind of snort at you and when they snort at you go oh man this is gonna be tough for that time <laughs> extremely high level training partners here hamidov trains with peter yan jose maria tome with henry cejudo He's been around that that right has found a home and yeah, where you see nice. someone shake it off the more you know it connected. That's a really nice front kick. He's been throwing up the middle. It's good range. And you can see the difference of his range compared to Tommy's right now. Some younger fighter. Oh! oh. That's a big oh. shot, and we're done. And that is what a body shot will do. And he set that up with those front kicks. Exactly what it was. You saw that he was the one that was able to establish the range, and he was throwing the kicks. All different levels landed that beautiful body kick. Outstanding job. Oh, that just landed right on the liver. And you see the delayed reaction is the giveaway. It is a total because it's almost like I oh I can no I can't. And the legs go away from you. Nothing that Tome could do right there. He is done. His body is shutting down. Perfectly placed kick. That's what it's all about. 14-0. That liver kick is like the stub toe times 100 when you. Did that happen or did it? Yeah, that happened. And Hamidov passes the test with flying colors in a minute. 101 KO, body side. Oh, yeah. Bad coming into your uh, Bellator debut one minute in KO body kick and you kick off literally the prelims doing that and it's almost like throwing the mic down and saying yeah. good luck everybody the gauntlet has been cast <laughs> to Michael C. Williams Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. One minute, one second. Round number one for the winner by TKO. Still undefeated, Cyber John Mogli Hamido. Hamidov puts his stamp on his Bellator debut and a stamp on the liver of Jose Maria Tome, a 61 second TKO to stay undefeated at 14 0. And just the start of things tonight as we say hello for the first time to Amanda Garrow. Hello, Sean. Just the start of uh, this crowd has been absolutely insane. I feel like we've been here for a while now. We still have a ways to go. I want to talk to you guys about our main event coming up tonight because it is absolutely incredible. Both of these guys are trying to make it into the Bellator for lightweight world grand prix we have coming up next year the winner of that gets a million dollars both of these guys if they win tonight they think that they are into this tournament we have adam the bomb the lottie mansura barnawi but these two guys coming from completely different directions adam with the he's a 13-time bellator veteran he's won four of his last six he's a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt we know adam piccolotti the world does not know Mansoor Barnawi, but he is one of those fighters who could be massive. I keep calling him sort of an enigma. He'll show up, he'll become a, a promotion champion, he'll win a tournament, and then he'll disappear. The last time we saw him three years ago when he won another tournament for a million dollars. So we'll see what he's got tonight. Back to you, Now, Amanda, you're exactly right in that, all right, baseball added extra seeds to the tournament. The NCAA tournament has a play-in. 
that's what this is for the Grand Prix, this main event tonight, because it would seem impossible that the winner of the main event fight tonight is not going to be invited into that tournament next year. And so, therefore, that's a golden ticket, and therefore, this becomes a, a, a play-in. The tournament starts tonight. You're absolutely right, because whoever wins this tonight, the winner is going to go in that tournament, and the loser is definitely not going to be part of it. So you're talking about a chance at a million dollars. In the meantime, we're going to see a lot of fighters tonight from SPG, the John Cavanaugh train group. We'll see a lot of them throughout the course of the prelims today. Keep an eye on Andrea Busey in this one. And now set to make his way to the cage, Stephen Hillbilly Hammer. Feels like you got a head start when you come in with a great nickname like the Hillbilly Hammer, which Stephen Hill does. Even better when you see with those, you see the numbers there. Every fight, every amateur fight, every pro fight, he hasn't gone near to go in the distance yet. No, not at all. And every one of those, as you pointed out, everyone has been a finish, never gone to the judges' scorecard. I just don't know how you become a Hillbilly coming from England. I imagine you could be one anywhere, right? <laughs> Now, please welcome Andrea in the bottom of her pussy. A huge ovation here in Milan for a fighter who was well known, overweight as a child, fell in love with MMA. 10 years ago, began training. It's, it's not an uncommon story, John, to hear people who later became professional fighters, very successful ones, who started, who took up the sport almost as a hobby, almost as training, almost as a way to be in better shape and to have a better life, and it opened up this, a light bulb sometimes goes off, and here is Andrea Fusi in his 15th professional fight. No doubt about it, you know, a lot of people, Khalil Roundtree will be fighting later today. 330 pounds goes to the gym to just lose weight, becomes a fighter, becomes a great fighter. The same thing with Fuzzy. I've watched Fuzzy fight many times. This guy is durable, tough. He loves the ground and pound. The real question is, does he want to be on the ground with Stephen Hill? Let's check out the tail of the tape. Take a look at that reach difference, 69.5. Fuzzy is the brawler. Stephen Hill, 73 inch. That is a nice, almost four inch reach advantage. We'll see what he does with it. Till Michael C. Williams. In the States, joining us live on YouTube at both channels, Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports. As we get set now for our second fight here at the prelims, we'll go three five-minute rounds at a contract weight of 181 pounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 179.9 pounds. His professional record undefeated at five and oh, he fights out of Hastings, England, Stephen Hillbilly Hammer. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 181 pounds, even as a professional. He's eight and six. He fights out of Erba Italia, presenting Andrea and Barbero Fusi. And the referee in charge, Michael Bell. Steven, stand right there, brother. Can you Andrea. say home court advantage? Andrea, Andrea, stand right there. Think there. There might be a little bit of a disadvantage here with the crowd. <laughs> First round, you ready, Steven? You ready, Andrea? Go! Every camp can be different with a whole variety of fighters, but give me something about SPG that puts a stamp on the fighters that train them. You know, the best thing I can tell you about SPG and one of the things that really separates them is I love when a fighter goes there. They don't try to change who that fighter is and what their strengths are. They just try to enhance the strengths and look at the weaknesses and how can we make those better so that they don't become a problem in our fight. That's a good camp. And that's why SPG is where it's at. When you have a leader like John Cavanaugh, 
that is everything because though everyone that trains it, they believe in him. They understand that he cares and they understand that he knows what he's talking about. Stephen Hill's got a beautiful double unders right here. He's just looking to sweep that leg to the outside and sweep him back. Bring him towards the right. That's where he takes him, straight down. Was that harder because of the size difference? It is harder because of the strength. There, You can see, when he's got those double unders, he's got the, the leverage advantage. But Fusi was able to sit his hips back. He was giving him some problems with it. Finally, he gets him down. The big thing, if you're Stephen Hill right now, you want to actually bring those hips up and slide them away from the cage to bring Fusi's back down onto that canvas. Is that one of the differences between someone with five pro fights and eight pro fights and 12 pro fights? That's one of those seven things. Absolutely. You, know, you, get just, you just get used to doing things automatically instead of thinking about them. Right back down. Nice bat return. That, that's demoralizing if you're fusing when you work really hard to get yourself back to your feet. You do a great job. You're up, and all of a sudden, you're right back to where you were, and you burned energy. Fusi was pretty emphatic. I'm a better striker, and that's all well and good, but not if you're there. There's one thing the ground definitely does. It takes away the, the advantage of height, reach, weight even, for a lot of fights. Once it gets to the standing position, it all comes back. Loaded question with an obvious answer, but are you seeing over the years and decades the grappling and the wrestling in the UK getting just uh, progressively is it not just dimensionally better? I mean, leaps and bounds ahead. There was a, very few guys in the beginning. You know, Ian Freeman was the guy that was one of the first ones out of the UK that actually, you know, tried to wrestle a little bit with it. And then guys just get, kept getting better and better. And you know, guys like Michael Bisping, not a wrestler throughout his career. A, a real good striker, but used defensive wrestling to keep himself on his feet throughout his career and became outstanding with it. And there were guys that just could never get, you know, Paul Daly had Hall of Fame talent, oh, but against a wrestler, he was, it was his kryptonite. You know, and, and you look, if, if Paul would have been able to have the skill set that he ended his career with right. in the beginning, right. boy, what a difference there would have been because he had power to knock anybody out at any time of the fight. Well, you saw some scary ones up close. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Stephen Hill's doing a great job as far as keeping the fight where he wants. But Fusey has been very good at just frustrating Stephen Hill. There hasn't been those moments where he's felt totally in control. Even when he gets him to the ground, the back goes against the cage right away. You see him trying to get there again right now. He really, at this point, turned that position. Very good. You see how he turned the position to get his back to the ground? That's being intelligent. But look at what Fusi does. Right back because he gave that space. You can't just put him there and think that it's going to stay. You've got to make sure that you put him where you want before you decide, I'm going to start to change this position. Smart round here for Stephen Hill. He had 10 seconds of toe-to-toe -to -toe and said, nope, level change. Let's go back to where I was in control. Fusi well, trying to sneak his arm underneath. He is, but he's going to take a look at where that's at. Strong opening round here for Stephen Hill. Time. Went to the takedown right away. Yeah, he did. And that, that's his bread and butter. You can't believe it. Fakes, brings him to the backside there. Beautiful. Double unders. And he did it repeatedly throughout. Here is what you saw. Fusi getting back to his feet, elevates, drops it down. That was the best takedown he had of the round right here. Sits him down again. Multiple takedowns, which controlled the fight. Not a lot of damage done by either guy. 
but a lot of energy put up by both. Oh, okay, nice deep breath. You're the warrior, you're the barbarian. Go and take his head off. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, you're ready. Right. Yeah. Second down, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Second down, let's go. Yeah. Andrea, yeah. Andrea, stand right there, brother. Steven, First round to Stephen right Hill. There. First round goes to Stephen Hill. Sometimes it seems like I'm deferring to your expertise, and really I'm just, that's a rhetorical Yeah, problem. it's all right. No problem Second round, you ready, Andrea? You ready, Steven? Go! You said that's Stephen Hill's bread and butter. Is that, should we update that expression since nobody, nobody eats bread and butter? Anymore? <laughs> well, what would it be? It's his, that's his kale salad. Oh, I don't, God, I don't know. You heard in the corner with John Cavanaugh telling Fusi, hey, you, you got to get after him. I need you to go after him. Let's, let's get into him. Let's hurt him. And fusi has got to start putting Hill on his back foot like you're seeing right there. That's exactly what his coach wanted to see. Now he's got the double unders. Just that forward pressure changes everything in the fight. He defends the takedown, which is why he lost round one. Time. Stop. Time. Do me a favor. Stand over there, brother. No. Steven, right there. Okay. There's really no I'm sorry that's good enough for this. There's, no, there's no hallmark card that covers. You see him right here. Okay. He brings yeah. it straight. He tries Watch to bring it. Watch the going, all right? Up. I'm going to keep it up. Uh, definitely grabs the cup. Lucy doesn't take much time, though. One of the things you want to look at, look at what Fusi's arms are, look at what he's throwing his punches. He's kind of pushing them out there, which is telling you those arms are getting heavy from all the acid and using them to try to stop those takedowns. Fusi, a couple of times, he's sort of hunting a guillotine that is not there. Slips right in to side control. That was a beautiful pass. Great job of using that pressure. Big shot. It's to a better spot. And one of the things you want to look at if you're looking at Stephen Hill, where he's at, he is, his right arm, he's got the underhook on that side. Fusi is actually grabbing the head. That is going to keep him on his back. He's going to have to dig for that underhook to try to start to move Hill. Got himself back to a half guard. And Hill's able to posture up at any time he wants it. Shoulder strikes, elbow strikes. This is interesting because Hill doesn't necessarily want him to get up. And it's one of those when you, 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 you watch him and say, why are you doing it? But uh, he, he's got the, the feel. He, he's in there and he's got the idea of what he wants to do. Now, looking for a hook here. He's to get that. She's got hip pressure. At least he got the right hook in. Left hook still out. He stayed, he stayed low there for a second. Looked like he was going to be too high. Nice job. This is the equivalent of taking what the defense gives you. And, it, and this is nothing but what we'll call a heavy hip ride. Yeah. But it's not easy to stand up in that position when you've got a man on top of you. Back to side control. He has not let Fuzzy get into a position where he can do any damage. Fusey did a nice job turning his body like you're seeing right there to try to change the position, get it back to a half guard. And you saw Stephen Hill take, move himself towards the head, bring himself back with his hips towards his opponent's hips, right in back. That was well done. Lost that back, though. Yeah, 
away, and he gave him his back for a second. Yes, he did. Beautiful pick of the ankle. Right back in the mouth, basically. Well, Stephen Hill is pitching a shutout here. No doubt. Right now, he's just mauling. Pussy. Going into round three, John Kavanaugh is going to have to tell him not what he wants him to do, but what he's going to have to do. The first thing is get through these last 12 seconds. Two big rounds for Stephen Hill, and John Kavanaugh kept it pretty simple. Close distance, big punches. Yeah, he did, but it's not going to be easy for him to do, especially with all of that energy he's put out. Those arms are heavy now, a little tired. If you're Stephen Hill, you got to look and say, man, you, you, you beat him up, you've worn him down, now you got to finish him. Enough to keep Fousey honest, like. Well, you know, if it was the first round, Fousey would have been able to counter that. He would have had the energy and everything, but now he's just accepting. He's looking for that one shot. Which is the great thing. You watch at home and you say, man, he's got to turn it on. He needs to have a big third round. Well, you didn't have somebody on top of you. For the last two exactly. Usually, or, or maybe you did. I don't know what's going on <laughs> in your house, but my point is that it's a That's it. You know, usually when, you, when you're looking for that one shot, it never comes because you, no. there's never that perfect spot. Oh, that was a nice cool body, body shot. shot. The left, the left hook. A nice clean front kick right up the middle. Remember when Hill has been in complete control, but remember what I said at the start, he has never been close to going the distance. Just nice, clean jab. Push kick the front. Nice, Mikey. All these being set up. You, Fusi is visibly frustrated at his inability to get inside here. And eventually, he's going to have to start taking some Hail Mary shots. Well, Fusi has a chin. We've seen it in his prior fights. He had a war with Walter Puglesi. I mean, they hit each other with bombs. But when you get tired, it is not an easy thing to fight someone who has been beating on you for, like you said, now 12 minutes, we'll say. Fusi cannot be here very long. Yeah, we'll bust it up now, too. Yep. See left eyebrow.
times you look at a fight and say, why didn't this guy do this or that? Well, it's because the other guy was beating him senseless. And it was ahead of him at every step. And you tend to not look at how impressive this performance has been from Stephen Hill against a veteran guy. And now they're both slippery. It's not easy to hold on to someone. Nice job of sweeping the leg out. He's got that back position again. He doesn't. At this point, he's only got the one. It's not even a hook position. Now it is, but he needs to, instead of sitting here and just looking for the position, start opening up. Make QC move to where you can apply that submission. John Cavanaugh. He knows, he knows what he's looking at. He saw this from the start. He saw it from the first minute. And when Fusi did no damage in the standoff in the first 30 seconds, this thing turned and it never, never even came close to coming Go back. Go, Andrea, you got to move. Minute 15, the first time for Hill, and he is just moving him wherever he wants to move. He's, he's saying, you're not going to be in your corner with him talking yeah. to you while I'm fighting. We're going to go to my side. Talk about fighters that move the game. He literally moved the game. <laughs> this is a real performance to build on for Stephen Hill. He had a longer fight. He was able to do more things. Still looking for that submission. This is not going to be giving it to him. So but Stephen Hill was on offense. Go, Andrea. You got to move. Fight. Absolutely. That was good stuff. Right. That's a shutout right there. Take a look at the shots that Fusey took. That was a big right hand, right on the chin. And once the fight really started to go, that little bit, that beautiful body shot, hits the leg, and he just started picking him apart. Anything that he did, it was working. He was able to take him down, get that back position. Just a bunch of volume shots that just add up after a while. A very, very clean and crisp performance by Stephen Hill, Billy Hammer. I love the nick. It's a strong one. And so is that performance. Easy. Now, to me, we'll spend the entire night talking about judging, but that to me is the definition of 30 to 27. There was no 10 8 rounds there. I mean, I just can't even see anything but 10 9, 10 9, 10 9. I agree with you completely. As you know, and I know, we never know. Sportsmanship of Montreal Fusi. He wants his fans to salute the effort of Stephen Hill. And he earned it. Let's see if Michael C. Williams' math matches ours. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your judges at cage side. Your first, Jacob Montalvo, 30 to 27. Your second judge, Brian Miner, scores it 29 to 27. Your third and final judge, Sal D'Amato, scores it 30 to 26. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Stephen the Hillbilly Hammer Hill. We'll have some 10-8s in there. 
I, to me, there was never a moment where it looked like the fight that Fusi was going to be beaten or the fight was going to be stopped. But no, to me, there wasn't any 10 8 rounds, but there was never a round that I thought Andre Fusi won either. Someone had to give one. Dominance is dominance, and no matter the score, that was a shutout pitched by Stephen Hill, who goes to 6 0. Oh. Coming up, 10 o'clock. Local time, 4 o'clock Eastern time back in the U.S. We go live on Showtime. All eyes on Adam Piccolotti and Mansoor Barnawi in the main event. Justin Gonzalez is going to open this event with a fight that I think is really important for him. Final fight of his contract, coming off a win, but not an overly impressive one. No, it wasn't, but it was against, It was a great win, but it didn't... Against a, su a supreme athlete, yes. super fast in Kai Kamako, who's only getting better as a fighter himself, so... Nothing to take from that. I, I thought that was a good win. The real difference here is Andrew Fisher's t a technician. He doesn't have the speed or the athleticism of Gonzalez, but he's a technician. So is Justin going to fight a smart fight? That's who we're talking about now. But Amanda, when this night is over, is Fabian Edwards going to be the guy we're talking about? on this one as well. All eyes, I was saying, need to be on our co-main event as well. Fabian Edwards going up against Charlie Ward in this middleweight bout. Fabian Edwards, as you mentioned, is a title shot next for him. He is number two in the rankings. But Charlie Ward, this is going to be the toughest test of his career. He is now 41 years old, but he thinks he can still be the best in this division. We have seen guys win titles at 42 and 43. He thinks he can do it. Fabian Edwards, a win very well may likely mean that his next fight could be a title shot. That is what he is working toward. Fabian Edwards, the younger brother of Leon Edwards, who of course just won his own belt by beating Kamaru Usman there. Fabian says it has been their life goal to be champions at the same time. And he is so close to that. Leon is going to be in his corner tonight. He says his brother knows exactly what to say to him. He calms him down. We cannot wait for this co-main event. Back to you. All right, Amanda, Fabian Edwards was once a can't-miss prospect who is now on the verge of a title shot. Another can't-miss prospect we know is Luke Trainer, And we talk about fighters being undefeated. Well, Luke Trainer is no longer undefeated as he heads into uh, that first fight back after the loss, which is always fascinating. And now to make his way to the cage, Lucas Cobra Arsina. Ready to make his way, Luke, the Jed Trainer. Ready or not, here I Part of the evolution of the sport, something that didn't exist, John, in the early days, was people identifying prospects. Hey, this guy's going to be great. So you, your first eight or ten fights or whatever, nobody had any idea what was going on. And so Conor McGregor lost fights at the start of his career. Nobody had any idea that it happened. Whereas Aaron Pico starts at Madison Square Garden and his first loss becomes something everybody looks at and sees. Luke Trainer finally had his first loss well after eyes were already on him. Well, eyes were on him because this kid has got it. First off, he's just a dynamite person outside the cage. Everything he does, him and his father, he's fantastic. But the skill set that he has inside the cage is quality. He has got great trainers with Ashley Grimshaw and Brad Pickett. He does great work on the ground when he gets there. The real question is how comfortable he is in the stand-up. Let's check out the tail of the tape and the Luke Trainer size is going to hit you right away. Real simple, 26 years of age compared to 36, and look at that reach of 81 inches for Luke Trainer. That's a sizable advantage. We'll see what happens. To Michael C. Williams. 
Tonight here in Milan, the prelims at Bellator 287 continue as we go to the light heavyweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first the blue corner at 6'3", weighing in 204.4 pounds. His professional record, 11 wins, three losses, hailing from Buenos Aires, Argentina, presenting Lucas Cobra Arsina. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot six, weighing in 204.8 pounds as a professional. Five victories, just one defeat out of Stevenage, England. Introducing Luke, the Jet Trainer. In charge, your referee, Jaron Bilal. John referenced it, but many of you know the story of Luke Trainer and the work he has done fostering children. It is extraordinary to find a human being at this age, by the way, John. That's the thing. It's a forget the fact he's a pro fight at his age to have his head on straight the way it is. Coming off the loss to Simon Biong. How did that fight get away? It got away based upon what oh, Luke kick, foot kick, I shot the change, I explodes into the takedown. This is exactly where Luke Trainer wanted to be in this fight against Alcina. He has a distinct advantage on the ground, so worked out well for him. But if you're taking a look at his fight against Beyond, everything that worked for him before didn't work. And he didn't have a backup to go to. He kept trying the same thing, and then he got tired. And that happens with a young fighter. They burn themselves out. He burned himself out in that fight. He got to learn from it. He says he has. We're going to find out right now. We're going to see Simon Biong a little bit later. But always fascinating to see what happens. Some fighters come back much stronger. Look at what happened to Austin Van. Beautiful job of grabbing that Darce right off of that big shot. Can he get it for Yeah, I was oh, going to yes, say, can he get it for me? You better believe he can. Especially with that oh, hook. There's a lot of pressure. Trouble. He's trying to lock it up. He lost it. Yep, he did. Had it for a second. Got the hook in, but... But you saw how physically strong when he ratcheted that Darce in that position and just forced Alcina down. It shows you the strength of Luke Trainer. Alcina trying to stay safe, grabbing the hands, grabbing the gloves. Don't grab inside the gloves. And that is why you can't do that. You for Jaron Varel remind him of the rule. Alcina right here just trying to keep those hands away so he can protect himself. Once one gets free this is when you're sick how much time is left in the round nice job of the setup by the train it's gonna be over that choke is in yeah, he's done. In deep he's turned him he's hooked him and we're done that was a masterpiece and luke trainer is back and that's what you want to see when you're talking about a, a fighter coming off of a loss where is his mind at where's the attitude Well, you can see the attitude right there. Because he's the one who has to live with the loss every night when he closes his eyes until this moment. And this is that release when you finally, you know you're better than that, but you gotta wait to get back in the cage and prove it. And yeah. he did. And take a look, you know, right here, beautiful front kick. You see how that snaps his head back and he goes right after him with it. He knows he got stunned. Now's my time to get inside without being hurt myself. Beautiful job by Luke Trainer. Ends up taking him down, and then when he decided to go for that neck, it was a beautiful transition. He's pounding, you see the hand come up, and he slides his other hand. Once his hand comes free here, he just reaches it through. And when he reached through right here, he gets a hold of that neck, and he locks it up quickly right there. And that was all she wrote. That was on tight. When you got a big man that is strong and has a squeeze, even if it's not under the chin, Sean, that will dislocate your jaw. He will drive that joint back to the point you can't take the pain. We are three weeks away from Vadim Nemkov and Corey Anderson, who's going to be a light heavyweight world champion, who's going to need to know that the next generation is starting to line up behind them. And it's going to include this face and this name to Michael C. Williams.
Ladies and gentlemen, the tap comes by way of a rear naked choke officially won. Minute 54 seconds, round number one. The winner by submission, Luke the Jet Trainer. Six wins for Luke Trainer. All early stoppages. He is back on the winning track, and we are back on track, headed towards a huge main card tonight. Amanda's got more. Sean, thank you so much. I want to talk about our second fight on our main card coming up tonight. We have Saul Rogers going up against Tim Wilde. These are two guys with big personalities, and you can better believe there are going to be big fireworks in this one. Both well known in the UK. They've been circling each other for the better part of a decade, and they finally meet in the cage tonight. Now, Saul Rogers, freakishly strong. Believe me, he was showing off his biceps. I think it made Big John a little jealous. That's okay. But he hasn't fought for a year. He's been dealing with a couple freak accidents there. As for Tim Wells, he told us, look, I want to feel the strength of Saul Rogers. I may not be as strong, or excuse me, I may not look as strong, but you can believe that I am strong too. And also, both of these guys, that lightweight World Grand Prix next year, both of them want to get in, and this is their showcase tonight. Uh, Amanda, John and I keep our shirt on during fighter interviews because we don't want the fighters to be intimidated. That's the only that, reason that, why. That must be what it that is. is exactly that is exactly is. why. I, I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew there was a reason why. I <laughs> have no illusions. We, we move to the welterweights now, and Nico Soli has been a fascinating prospect to watch. Still just 25 years old. This might be, this has got a chance to be the fight of the night. And now to make his way to the cage, Burakmo Kamara. We talked earlier about the evolution of British wrestling, grappling, the evolution of MMA fighters from France, John, that you've seen in a, in a country that had banned the sport and outlawed the sport. Obviously, you're starting from way behind. It was leave home or fall way behind, and now we're seeing more and more young fighters. That's exactly it. You're seeing guys like Kamara who just have power. Here's a guy who is, he's listed at 6'4", shot. He is well above that. This guy is tall and long for the weight class of welterweight, and he does have power. He was taking big shots in that fight. Yeah, he did. He did a great job of hanging in there, and when given the opportunity, man, he lit his opponent up. We've seen that the power is there. And now we welcome the Monkey King, Nicolo Soli. seeing for Niccolo Soli, and so this means a lot to him. It's a great song for it. You know what? He is a dynamic fighter. This guy goes after his opponents. So I don't think that there's going to be much slow about the fight. Maybe the song starts out that way, but it gets going, and so will Niccolo. He 
is home, both in the cage and back in Italy. Another SPG front spent so much time in Dublin. So excited to be in this fight at home. And as we check out the tail of the tape, John, I can tell you this is the first time that Igor Soli has faced a fighter who is taller than he is. No doubt about it, man. You look at this, and I'm being honest, Nick Soli at six foot two and everything. Look at the reach difference. Yep. 71 point five 79 for a camera that is a huge reach advantage to michael c williams for those joining us tonight across the uk live on bbc iplayer we welcome you here to the prelims as we go now to three five minute rounds in the welterweight division introducing the blue corner at six foot four weighing in 170.9 pounds his professional record five wins one loss out of paris france presenting Buramo Camara. and across the cage his adversary out of the red corner at six foot two weighing in 170.8 pounds as a professional three victories one defeat fighting out of dublin ireland by way of biella italia introducing nicolo the monkey king solely and your referee in charge brian minor the chant is nico 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 There a danger of too much adrenaline in a situation like this. Oh, absolutely. You, know, you don't want to burn yourself out, but every time that we've seen Soli fight, he goes after his opponent right away. He wants them to know, I am not going to let up. I'm going to be after you the whole time. So we're seeing a nice grab of the cage there, but we're seeing exactly what he does every time. by Soli. And this is what you were talking about, you know, that experience. You know, fighters from France, wrestling has not been that big suited, you know, type of element that they're, you know, really good at. They think trying to catch up, it's not an easy thing to catch up and it takes time, it takes all kinds of work. And you can see sometimes when it's just a difference in them not expecting the takedown to come when it does. And it's funny because Kamara talks about he wants his striking to catch up with his grappling. Right now, he's just trying to catch up with Nico Soli. Who, not down at SBG, spent a lot of time working with Pedro Carvalho and Peter Quigley. One of the things is you're watching Soli here and you see that he's putting a lot of pressure from the guard down onto Kamara's head area and his neck. With all the long levers that Kamara has, it's difficult for him to land a clean strike. Does Soli have his hips where you want them? Well, he was trying to pass there for a second, but right now it's good. You see he's got the elevator hook. As far as Kamara's got that left elevator hook in there. But every time he starts to push, you see Soli sink his hips down, put weight on him. He's in complete control right now of the position. He knows exactly where he wants to be. Their final has ever been stopped. And now, coming down strong with the elbows, that sort of changes the dynamic. The more urgency from Kamara to get out of that spot. There was a mistake you saw by Soli in there. You saw him starting to push down on the head, and then he let go of it and went for the underhook. That allowed Kamara to come into his legs. That's why he ended up against the fence where he's at. Why do mistakes like that happen? Too anxious? Yeah, you know, you're, you're trying to you're trying to make things happen, and you look, you think that you can do something, all of a sudden it's not there, and now you're in that position. Oh, I've made this mistake. Nice job. Oh, yeah. Slowly coming over the top. Looking for the Dars. Well, big shots, big elbow strikes. Right 
there. Went through the throw. You saw him slip right off. And now Kamara has the bat. And this is what we saw to Kamara in the first time we saw him here in Bellator. Is he, you know, he was getting pushed around. It was almost like, a, you know, does he allow this to happen or is this just being forced upon him? And eventually he turned the corner on it. Now we're taking a look. He's got the back of Soli. Soli looking for a Kamara grip. That's not going to work for him. We'll see what Kamara can do from here. Why is that? Explain to people why that's not going to work here. <laughs> With grabbing that is great to try to stop something at times, but Kamara's been moving himself towards his left-hand side. And when that arm shoots through and your arms are that one side, your whole body is open to be hit by the knees and stuff. Not a good place to be. the emotion of Soli early in the round all that adrenaline Kamara has turned his first round 180 Soli trying to fight the hands get himself to turn inside of this right here there he does it Kamara still in on that Made the same mistake he made just a little bit early. Went for that throw, too slippery. Wasn't able to lock in on his opponent. Ends up in a bad position. End of round number one, and what you can see, an emotional night for Nico Soli. He's fighting that way, and Amanda, he's got reason to, right? Yeah, absolutely. You see all of his hands there over my shoulder. I got to tell you, they were the first ones in this building about an hour before the prelims began. But it's really interesting. You can't tell, but from where I'm standing right now, it's really close to where the fighters walk out. And before his fight, normally you'll see fighters jumping around, maybe listening to some music. He was standing head to head, perhaps with his grandma or his mother. I'm not sure. That woman right there and she was just praying over him touching him pumping him up and he was silent the entire time just nodding his head but they stood there like that head to head for about five to ten minutes and you can tell just how serious this fight is for him tonight john there are pros and cons to that i would imagine yes there are yeah you got to take a look and you say hey everything that you know you're seeing from him inside right now is he's making some mistakes because he's trying so hard and he wants to make something happen just let the fight come to you. Just go out there and do the things that you've been training to do at SBG, and the fight will unfold in front of you. You ready? You ready? Fight. And again, he comes out strong in round number two. Did he do enough early to win round one? You know, I think he did enough early. He, he lost the position, and he ate some shots near the end of that, but probably did enough to get the nod. Here he just went out the same thing again, and this is what I'm talking about. You're putting yourself into these bad positions based upon mistakes. Because those can't those be out. in the cage. What he's trying to do is look for that arm bar. He can't get that. There just comes left the arm bar. It's all on. Look at that's a long lever. Oh, yeah. he decided to pull out of it. So that we have this bird's eye view to see that he might have been closer to having it than he may have realized. It might have been that he felt the arm slipping or anything like that. That's a big difference, and that would be smart of him. Once he feels that slip, don't try to stay with something you don't have. So he saw his mom, he saw his fans, he's seen his coaches. He's trying to put pressure to extend that arm out. And it's obvious that Kamara is, he's got length. And sometimes guys that are skinny, they look, look you go, oh, he's not that strong. No, he's got leverage strength. He's a strong individual. Spot much earlier here in round two. Uh, he can go to work. Nice, 
Sully, and it should be in Sully's mind. You're going to be on your back, okay? You're looking for the submission. When it doesn't come, I've got to either start to think about getting this reversal or getting my back up against that cage and getting myself back to my feet. I do not want to have Kamara on top of me throughout this round. It's not going to go well for me. Is this all defensive from Soli here? No, it's not. What he's trying to do is he's working at that arm. He's changing the angle on this. And if you can do a couple of things, he's getting past that right arm. He can take the back. But with the cage where it's at, Sean, he's got yeah. very little chance of that happening. Throws again in the fence. Where the fence is trying to push off to give himself that room. Yeah, he's trying to turn uh, that corner and get that space. Well, camera has pushed him and kept him in this phone booth virtually the entire five minutes. One of the things that we haven't seen from Nico that you would have liked to have seen in this transition, he keeps going back to that arm bar, but. The triangle has been open a couple of times that switch from that, that arm bar attack to the triangle back to the arm bar. You catch your opponent in that transition. Because we haven't seen a lot as far as, you know, if you're looking at Kamara at being on the top position, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't really done any damage. He's landed a couple little elbows, but he's been defending more than he's been offensive. The arm bar again. Way too late. Solely better hope that he won the first round. Yes, he better. In which case, we're even going to the third. Good. Uh, three. Uh, three. Quick. Two fighters trying to get on a very crowded list at 170. Both 25 years old. Both have been impressive. Early Bellator fights. Slowly came out with a lot of emotion. Started the first round quick, started the second round quick. No shot. Nico, right there. Right there. Nico, right there. Hey, hey. Brian Miner's not having it today. <laughs> He's running the show. Brian Miner is hot. He's sweating. He's got toes in Nico, the cage. low. <laughs> now someone's hitting the groin. Things are just not going the way he wants. You got time. 
<laughs> and you tell you tell your kids don't do something and they keep doing it that will change your mood for the worse We've had this yeah, conversation before about it's counterintuitive, hey. but fighters tend to want to go back maybe before they Fight. should. Absolutely. You know, many, many times a guy will force himself back based upon you know, he's in shape and he doesn't feel his opponent's in as good a shape. So they'll go back even before they should just to try to keep an advantage that they believe they have. On the feet, though, if you take a look, you see that was a beautiful. Nice uppercut by Kamara right there. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're looking at Kamara to say take this fight to the ground because when he was on the ground was solely in that second round. He had a lot of opportunities to do something. Really wasn't offensive. It was more defensive trying to stop the arm bar, So In the stand-up, he's been effective. He's got to keep the fight at, at that range. I would say from about three, three and a half minutes into the first round until now, it's been his fight. It probably wasn't enough to win back the first round. Particularly with the crowd going so crazy over Soli at the start. But you've got to figure, this isn't an even fight. You have got to show the judges that you deserve this last round if it ends up going the distance. And you don't want to be in that position where all of a sudden he lands a couple good strikes. That's the difference maker in this fight. Yeah, this one is very much up for grabs here as we move to the halfway point of round three. And the majority of it has been right along the fence. Come on, John, let's work. Soli talked about never having fought anyone taller than he is. So this is, these are all different angles he's working with. Yeah, the, the, and the real difference is Soli is he's used to doing things a certain way, picking people up, how you can lift and elevate them to get them to the ground. Well, none of it's working against Kamara at times based upon his toes are dragging on the ground. There's a friction there. It's just different fighting a guy that's got that much length. Carvalho is 5'11", Queely is 5'11". Think about the guys he's... Yeah. Training with, good, working with. And, and, and look, I'm being honest. Go standing right, next to Kamara, he's bigger than 6'4". He's about 6'5". Easy. Soli can have a big final minute here and be on offense. That may be enough to steal it. And so right shot. Here he goes. Locked in the choke. We'll see if he gets it. That's deep. It's tight. Kamara not giving in. Nice job. Soli still in a great position to do damage here. He's trying to free his leg. And again, if you're watching this with no sound, no crowd, no nothing. You may be seeing it and feeling it differently. And live in the building. Oh, 
Both trying to open up in the final seconds. This is Both tired. This is going to be a tough one. The long stretches of control, is that what's going to decide it? Or was it the flurry in the final 90 seconds from so? It almost was moved as Soli came very close to getting that choke in deep. Well, that, that choke means a lot because if you think about it, that choke had Kamara in trouble during the round. Where did Kamara have Soli in trouble? Yep. Gets flat on here. You see Soli come around. He takes the back. Kamara stays there. And then he gets the choke on. Now he gets out of it. But it's the same as you being hit by a big shot and not getting knocked out. That's great. But it, it's something more than what you were doing during this round. And so that might be the difference maker in who wins this fight. Kamara held him along the fence for three and a half minutes, had positional advantage. But what Soli did didn't last very long, but it was an attempt to finish the fight, a couple of shots, and again, they have a very proud mom either way. But let's see if her son Nico is going home with a win. Or staying home with a win. It's a nice looking eye there that Kamara has. Yeah. See the damage that was done. So, what did you think? In, in that third round? Look, you got it. I in the third round. I have one guy that tried to finish the fight, came close to finishing the fight. That's a difference maker. That's what we're looking for. I'm looking for the guy that's trying to not let this thing go to the judge's decision. The guy who is actually trying to put an end to the fight. And that was Nico Soli. We have the opinions. Michael C. Williams is going to have the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Jacob Montalvo, scores the fight 29 to 28. He scores the fight for Soli. Your second judge, Sal D'Amato, 29 to 28. He scores the fight for Kamara. Your third and final judge at cage side, Michael Bell, scores the fight 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision. The Monkey King, Nicola Soli. Single point, and probably, as you said, John, by that 15, 20 second stretch late in round three. I think that was the difference maker. When you're taking a look at it, control. When you're looking at the judging criteria, it's about the striking or grappling, which took place more. Well, it actually was more grappling than striking in that round. And when you look at that grappling, who was the one that tried to finish the fight with? It was Nico Soli. That's why he would get the round. You can go home again, and you can win. Once you get there, to Amanda. Sean, thank you. He got the round. He is making the rounds there around this entire arena. Uh, let's talk about our main card coming up. I'm not sure if we can beat what just happened, but our main card coming up tonight is absolutely incredible. The very first fight on that card, Justin J. Train Gonzalez going up against Andrew Fisher here. Fisher is the veteran in this. He is 37 years old. He hasn't lost since 2016, but Justin Gonzalez is a huge opponent for him. And J. Train, he wants this one. He wants it bad. He's 13-1. and one. That one loss coming two fights to go to Aaron Pico. It's a fight he wants back. He has 
He's now eighth in the featherweight rankings, but says he should be higher. So he wants to finish tonight with dominance. He's not afraid of some trash talking either. He says, look, I am smarter. I am younger. I am faster. I am stronger. Andrew Fisher was an absolute technician, though. I have a couple things to say about that. Sean, back to you. Yeah, and Amanda, one of the things he had to say, and it's interesting to me, John, is that he was saying, everybody's faster than me. Everybody's faster than me. So at that, I know what you're saying. I know he's faster than I am, but so is everybody else. I'm not going to let that be a factor in this fight. Incredible electric moment here in Milan. But Simone Bion, he had an electric moment last time out, as we told you, against Luke Trainer. We'll see if he can follow up with another impressive victory and get his name on the list at 205. Way to the case, Dragos, the Dragon Zubko. Simon Hamlet Bihar. Cameroonian now calls Italy home. Followed up a win and rises by getting the call from Bellator to be a last minute fill in for the big tuna. It turns out the fight Christian Edwards and he gave Christian Edwards all he wanted in that fight. And then John last time out, suddenly everyone expecting this, this Luke Trainer express run towards the top to just keep on rolling over and beyond. And it didn't happen. No, it did not. But the, uh, the one thing you, when you're looking at Simon and Beyond, first off, this guy is athletic. He is very strong, very fast. And he, when he goes, I mean, he throws with everything he has. Sometimes he'll overextend, sometimes he'll make mistakes, but his athleticism gets him out of those mistakes a lot of the time. And when he gets to the top position, he is a menace on the ground, and he goes after his opponent with vicious strikes. Sometimes, you know, there, there are ones that we go that doesn't have a whole lot of skill to it, but it's still got power. Oh. Check out the tail of the tape as we move to 205. Very simply put, you can look at Zubko, who has fought at heavyweight, a smaller light heavyweight, 72.5 inch reach compared to 80 inches for Simon Bignon. That is a big advantage. To Michael C. Williams. And now here at Bellator 287, the prelims will go three five minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at six foot two, weighing in 203.4 pounds. His professional record three wins, one loss by way of a Moldova. He fights out of Lazio, Italia. Please welcome Dragos, the Dragon Zucco. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot five, weighing in 205.8 pounds as a professional. Eight victories, two defeats. Originally from Cameroon, he fights out of Genova, Italia. Simon Hemley. 
in charge, your referee, Jaron Noel. Young, an unbelievable athlete. Can he make up for the time that he didn't have that high level training early in his career? The win over Luke Trainer is a good start. Well, that's a good question because he came into fighting from being a professional basketball player here in, here in Italy. And so we know that he is athletic. He's just got to make up. For the lack of knowledge when it comes to the martial arts and all the skill sets necessary to be effective in MMA. Look what Zuko just did right there. Nice one two combination, nice and controlled. Waited for the mistake by Beyong and then attacked. Beyong, who's a fascinating guy on a variety of levels, but he said he didn't, he had the athleticism and the size as you can see for it, but he didn't love basketball and he didn't feel like it was his special thing. Zuko. This is where Zuko is going to end up having problems right. against right. inside. Young. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful, nice inside trip there. You can see in the stand-up where Beyong's having problems with Zuko, and he's he's lifting his chin up a little bit. That's not good for him. But when it gets to the ground, he does have good base, good balance, and when he <laughs> postures up, he lands big shots. When you see a fighter who's incredibly talented but hasn't had it, what are you seeing that they did not get training-wise? Well, what you're looking at for someone like right here, Beyond, he needs to get that arm out, doesn't get the arm out. There's the arm out, so you notice what happens. And so it's all the little things that you watch in the middle of the fight that you go, that's a little thing that you should have known. It should have been automatic from your training, and it hasn't been taught to him. It hasn't been part of what's been pushed into that computer yet. And so they make some mistakes that they have to make up for. He has the athleticism to do that. But against someone like Zuko, he doesn't want to be in certain aspects of this fight. In the stand-up, he's going to be at a disadvantage as far as the technique and the footwork. And at this level, those things have to be second nature automatic, and sometimes they're not. That's it. But pure strength, you can see. Look at this man. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying there was anything wrong with it technique-wise. It wasn't perfect. But man, it worked because he is physically strong. Just from the reaction of Zuko off of that one elbow strike. Look at where both of his hands went. Yep. Both of them go to that arm, so it's like, ooh, I don't want that to happen again. Which shows you the power that Beyong has. <laughs> again, strong. Driving him back with that elbow. And driving his head down into that canvas. Zuko attempting continuously to try to drive that elbow across. He's unable to. Now in full mount with Rubion. He slid right into that. You saw the marks you can already see on Zuko in that lower rib area. It seems like Beyond is content to keep him here as opposed to or trying to advance it. Young at this point, he needs to say, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm going to posture like this right here. Don't keep your head so low. You have the advantage. Use that advantage, your length. You can hit him and he can't hit you. When we're talking about to the head area right now, he can always hit you to the body, but to the head, you've got the clean shot. He does not. That's what we're talking about. Beautiful elbow strike. Nice movement, beautiful base and balance by Dion. Keeping Zuko where he does not want to be. The elbow strike still raining down. There you go. Now he brings yep. him over. Now 
all of that bumping that you see, you want him, when you're bumping, you want to bring him not just to the side, you want him up over the head, coming towards where now the cage is at, which is going to stop him. In the midst of technique, which may not always be perfect, is feats of strength in the middle of the round from beyond. That was dominant. Saw clean strike right there. Yep. Nice right hand by Zuko. And when you're seeing Biong, as far as a lot of those hands coming out, this was that beautiful inside trip for the takedown. And he was able to hold this position. He got the mount, landed some big elbows. And near the end, he got hurt. You could see that Zuko was hurt by those strikes. Let's go, let's go. Seconds out, stool. Let's go. Ice, let's go. All the way back, all the way back. There might be those that thought that was 10-8. Was it? Very close. Depends on what you're saying. Was he Fight. damaged? I think he was. So Zuko almost backing away from these feints in the first few seconds of the round, which he was not doing at the start of round one. Zuko looking for that big right hand. Young's got it. He wants to suck those hands just a little bit lower underneath those hips. He's got that takedown. What he's concerned with right now is Zuko's got that guillotine. See where Biong's right arm is. That's going to prevent Keep it clean. Zuko from getting those gloves together. Well, Zuko's got his gloves together, but he doesn't have the angle for any type of key and attack with where his arms are at. We saw before physically, Biong was able to muscle. He's going to throw him off the hip. There you go. So strong. And right into full mouth. Easy. Yeah, and this is not good because we saw earlier that Zuko was unable to get out of this position off of numerous attempts. Here he is pushing again. Again, that's a big energy burst with zero coming back as on return from it. Unable to get him off, and now he's eating some elbows. And that was far less time left in the first round when he got him in this spot. Yeah, what, what we saw at the end of that first round with some of the shots that Zuko took, they affected him. You saw him a little bit rattled from those shots, shaking his head, trying to clear the cobwebs out. Watch the fingers. It's fine. Keep fighting. He's done a really good job holding this position. See, just one little attempt with just one thing that's not going to get him off of you. You've got to put different techniques together. Trap one side, go to that side off of the bump and, and roll him through. Get your hands on the hips, start to push him through and wiggle your legs out. You want to strip your legs out. Nothing like that is being done by Zuko, and he's not going to muscle his way out of the position. And Zuko is doing everything he can do to defend himself from these shots. That was a big slicing elbow by Beyond. The real problem for Biong, all Biong needs to do, he needs to move his hips up higher. Bring them a little bit higher. And he has all the position in the world. The hips will be taken out of play. Now he's got his head higher like you want. Exactly. 
and just keep back. opening up our game close. We're done. We're done. We're done. Good job, brother. You have a cut above your eye. One sec. And the former basketball player, who's a painter in his spare time, just painted another masterpiece. Dominant performance from Simone de Young. What you see now with those hips coming up higher, you see the knees going under the arms of Zuko. Young's in a position just to launch an attack on him. Zuko right now has no defense. He doesn't understand how to get himself out. He's worn himself out trying to push and use power to get himself out. Now he's just eating shots. Big shot right there with the left hand. There was a left early in the sequence. That one right there, that's the one that opened up Zuko and that changed the dynamic, which was already one-sided. And opened up that cut. Simone Bion took a couple of decent shots in the first 15, 20 seconds of the fight, and that was it. He is putting together a pretty impressive Bellator resume here. It's two big wins in a row. Something happened between the corner of Zubko and Simone Bayon because there was some words, there was some sign language was, given. <laughs> he could have been telling them they were number one. I, I thought that's what it was. To Michael C. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Three minutes, 36 seconds. Round number two, the winner by TKO, Simon Hibley. Now nine and two, coming off an impressive loss, if there is such a thing, to Christian Edwards in a late replacement situation, and now back-to-back -back wins over Luke Trainer and a dominant one here over Jago Zuko. Good job, guys. Good job. Simone Bion continues to climb the ladder. We are headed towards the main card in Milan tonight, highlighted by a lightweight showdown. So fascinating the contrast between a fighter, Adam Piccolotti, in which we are so familiar with him and watching him in his Bellator climb over the last eight years, and Monsieur Barnoui, the wild card here who has fought at the highest level but hasn't fought in three years. Fabian Edwards with his eyes not only on Charlie Ward tonight but on what may be next if he can win and win impressively. Saul Rogers and Tim Wiles, as Amanda was saying earlier, circling each other for a decade in the UK. They fought on the same card at times. And tonight they will finally fight each other. And is this tonight Justin Gonzalez makes his claim for a top spot in the lightweight rankings. Now, there are entertaining fighters in the cage, there are entertaining fighters outside the cage, and then there is Yves Landou, who is very much both. And now, to make his way, Walter Furiano. Simple man says I like nothing else but locking myself in the cage and fighting. Come to the right place.
set now to make his way, Eva, you know. Bellator 287, the prelims continue now as we go three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot eight, weighing in 146 pounds. He is professional record, 11 wins, three losses, one draw by way of Dublin, Ireland. He fights out of Novara, Italia. Well Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 145.6 pounds as a professional, 17 victories, nine defeats, fighting out of Paris, France. Eva, you know, Landu in charge, referee Jaron Vallel on my cue. Fighter, fight! Here we go with 145. We got some news coming up later on tonight. On the world champion, Patricio Pitbull. Well, the last time that we saw that do fight, it was at 155, and we yeah. talked about man, he was so small yeah. to his opponent, and he decided to go down to 145. So. We're going to see if this was a smart move for him. Right now, he's looking very comfortable. When do you see that with older fighters going down? And usually, you know, you'll get a, there's a drop off as far as the speed is different. The, the smaller guys are faster. But he was so fast in the lightweight. She looked and he said, I don't think that's going to be a difference for him. And right now, you can see it's not. With so many fighters going up now and saying, why didn't I do it soon? <laughs> it feels so much better. Yep. And most of the time, I'm the first person to say, don't go down, go up. But for Landu, there was no doubt. Yeah. And you can see, you know, just taking a look at Leandro, he's big. He's bigger than Land Landu still. And this is at 145. Nice clean yeah. right hand. Well, Leandro ate that one, charging in. And there are certain fighters under the umbrella of the Michael Van and Pages or whatever that are very hard to prepare for. Because if they don't know what they're going to do, how can you know what they're going to do? Yeah, that's exactly it. And it's like this kind of situation right here. Right now, Coleandro is used to being able to get his opponent off of his feet. He almost did. Now it has. 
Nice job by Coleandro to get the back, but he's still got a ways to go here. And this is what, when you're facing someone that's as athletic and has that just balance and movement that Landu has, problems arise that it's all of a sudden you have you have no you don't. Inside trip. Leandro needs to be very careful about holding on to that head right now. He is not going to make a guillotine work from the position he's in. And you can get your arm trapped here. How many fights have we seen turned by guys going for a guillotine? James Gallagher, Apache Mix, spending so much energy going for something that isn't there. Very nice use of the cage by Coleandro. You saw that big kick and explosion off the cage. That's what put him in this position. Got some interesting options here from this north-south spot. Submission victory. He's got, well, what, and what you want to see from Landu is exactly what he's doing. He needs to keep Coleandro's legs from in this anaconda choke. You want to crush that position. If he can get on top there, he's good. He got his position. He's fine. Got, yeah, exactly right. Landu got exactly what you said. Back but, to it. And he needs to keep those legs, keep that head from getting crushed against his own arm. Coleandro doing a good job of sticking with it. Knees right here would be the smart move. It almost feels like he's got a clean shot, but he doesn't want to lose the grip. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, because he's trying to hold on to that anaconda, and he's out. He didn't get either. Oh, oh big shot, yeah. That hurt him, he's hurt. Koyanju is really hurt, Landu knows it. And this is where he gets aggressive. Koyanju trying to clear those cobwebs. setting up something spectacular. You can see it. You can see his mind working. Well, Andrew just needs to get back to the fight. Many times you, you burn that energy looking for that submission. You give it everything you have, and it, what normally works for you doesn't finish that guy. It can start to bring your confidence down. You need to just let it go. Get back after. Fascinating round one. Many twists and turns. Takedown when Landu he slips it up, but you see where that arm's at. Gets good position, but Coleandro is able to drive the arm through once he pushes off of that. He pushes off of that fence, gets go, that go anaconda choke, but he cannot get a hold back. of the legs of Landu, which would help compress him back. against his own arm. He's squeezing right here, but that's not normally going to do it. Back. You need that compression of the entire body. He never got it, and that's why it never worked. And then the Fight. big turning point, Koyandru didn't want to let go of the grip he had when you said he had a great chance to throw some knees. Yep. Didn't do it. Didn't get either. And then Landu turned it around, landed some shots, and dominated the final minute. Maybe enough to steal it. It seems crazy, but then again, why would you think someone's coming with something like that? No, there's no logic to it, so you're not expecting it. Nice job. Yeah. Those hips. Went for this in the first round, didn't get it. He gets it here and 
drives Koyandro hard to the mat. Very well done. But this actually might be for Koyandro. Being on the yeah. ground is not a bad thing. Uh, he's got a good game down here. He's a brown belt in jujitsu, black belt in judo. He understands the ground. Nice pass by Landu. Landu's been around again, another Parisian who said to be sort of a wanderer, spent some time at AKA. He had a fight in the Bryson as well. Looking for that Kimura right here, and you're right, he had to do a lot of traveling around, and that, that was for a lot of guys that were from France. But now, look at his corner, his coach, Cyril Diabati, who's fantastic K1 fighter, fought in MMA, even made it to the UFC. That's the difference now that you're seeing in French fighters. They're getting good coaching, and you're seeing the improvements. He's got a very good chance of making this Kimura work if he can control that head and separate that arm. Nice job of driving him back. Good job by Cole Leandro. He understood exactly what he had to do. Looking for the leg. Subtle thing, but again, a more experienced fighter. Landu, the second he knew he didn't have it, moved right on to the next thing. Yes. Which shows maturity as a fighter. Many times guys are going to hold on to something. You go, why are you holding on to something you know you're going to lose? Cole Leandro looking yeah. towards the toe hold. Maybe, yeah, he, and he knew he didn't have that. Yep. Not doing side control. What's he thinking about now? What are they expecting him to do? We'll do something else. Going after that arm again. Looking for the Kimura. But you're talking about it. The Kimura is a strength move. It takes a ton of strength to make that happen. Nice job of using it to get to him out. Beautiful transition. Look at that. Into full mount. Now, is he strong enough to hold it? He have the balance. Yeah, nice job yeah. of him to roll through, but he realizes he's losing it. Right yep. back. Right nice to the job. next thing. And this shows you that evolution that we've been talking about with him. Before, he would have been standing up and not keeping that position. He would have been doing things. You're going, why? Now he's fighting a lot smarter, a lot more mature. That's why he's a more dangerous fighter. Because he still has that. He has the other stuff. He's just not going to go to it in case he needs it. Escapes trouble there. Fight ending shots, but they're building blocks. Well, the one thing that, he, that I really like that I'm seeing out of Vandu is he's not trying to hit him hard. He's not trying to throw everything into it. He's trying to touch him. He's doing that, and eventually they just add up, and one of those is going to put you on your butt. Like the distance that Landu is keeping himself from Coleandro? Absolutely. You take a look, and you know, Coleandro has the longer reach and everything, but who's the one that's touching? Coleandro's always a couple inches off. He cannot figure out the range and distance that he needs to land the shots. Nice job of circling out by Landu. spectacular city we have enjoyed our time here very much the Duomo right in the middle so many of these European cities built around a central 
So the downtown spot. And John, they, they love the they love the bikes and the motor scooters and the whole thing. One thing I've learned as a lifetime pedestrian is when you're in Milan, you're looking out for more than cars and buses when you're in Italy. Yeah, it's just scooters, a little bit more. There's a lot of stuff going on. Bicycles. And Boyandro has been hit with a lot of stuff. All the way that back. He didn't see coming too. Here we go. Been fight. a real progression type fight for Landu. At 36, he is showing that he is still evolving. If you're Cole Andrew and you're coming out and you're tired and you're a little bit sore now, Landu's coming out. He's talking to himself. Yep. He's looking happy. That's not what you want to see. So you, if you miss the first 10 minutes of the fight, you're wondering who's winning. All you can do is watch these 10 seconds here. Cole Andrew looking for an opening and Landu just too quick. Who's only been stopped twice? 26 pro fights. He's hard to catch. See, and right now, Landu got that. Uh, don't put your arm on that side. Why? Both that head. You've got a von flu choke right there. His arm will then be trapped. You start putting shoulder pressure down. That is a beautiful, beautiful choke. But if you don't set it up. Nothing. I was told that as you saw Landu going back, kind of rolled his ankle, so he might have a problem with that ankle there. That yeah, he, he was favoring it, so that would be one of the reasons he'd go to the ground. You don't have to be on your feet here. Got a nice crucifix here. Andrew's still on offense. How many different types of offense have we seen in 12 minutes? One thing he wants to do in this position, is if he can, stop with the punching and start launching the elbows. The elbows are going to fit perfectly in yep. that space. He just got in. Much harder, much more difficult to stop, and much quicker in making a referee stop that contest. Nice job by Walter Cogliano to move himself to get out of that crucifix. It's not an easy thing to do. He breaks the arms apart. Right back to the crucifix. crucifix. Now he's going after that Kimura. Yeah. Looking, looking for the key lock here. Americana. Biggest problem is where his left arm is, He's unable to control the head from that position, which puts a lot of the pressure, takes it right off. But he has stayed on offense throughout this, this entire fight. Nice job, just move, jump right over into that Easily. Easily. side control. Push them out, yep. straight into it. The deeper this fight has gone, the easier Orlando is making it look. Coleandro, he's found no way of stopping anything that Landu wants to do. He's unable to out-grapple him, which you look and go, if there was going to be an area that you thought he could be successful in, it would be in the grappling. That just has not turned out to be his advantage. Landu loses full mount, so he's going to work with the back. Body lock. We enter the final minute. Koyandro for this entire third round has just been moving his king. Check, 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 check. He has been been doing things that has kept him from being finished.
fight Roddy Piper would have loved because every time Boyandre thinks he has the answers. Landu kept changing the questions. Grounded. Grounded. That was an impressive performance. I always wonder about guys that still have the energy to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, with everything he did in the fight, you can still do that. I'm okay with it. Assuming a Landu win here, that would be his seventh in his last nine outings. Go to three and one as Bellator. The only loss, the unanimous decision loss to Tim Wilde, who we'll see. Gets all Rogers. And that was at 155. And we talked about you know, one of the fights we go, he's just too small comparatively. That was the difference. have been baffled by how long it takes to add to 30. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? Carry the one. But Poyandro had a promising start. You forget about it in the first two or three minutes, but really one mistake, one opening is all Landu needed to turn the fight around about two and a half, three minutes into it, and boy, he never, never looked back. To Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go now to your three judges. Your first Brian Minor scores in 30 to 26, while Michael Bell and Sal D'Amato both see it the same 30 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Eva. You know. He has won seven of nine, and he has found a home, it appears, at 145. And if you don't know, that's you know. Shout out, Darian Caldwell. If his ankle was hurt, if it wasn't hurt before, it may be now. Yves Landu may be a throwback, but we look forward to the co-main event tonight, and the stakes are huge right now. It's been a big year in the Edwards family, and a win tonight for Fabian Edwards right on the periphery of a title shot at 185 and a chance to make a statement in a spotlight fight tonight. Oh, absolutely. You take a look, man. It's set up for him. He gets back by Charlie Ward. Who has the title? A guy that's a wrestler. Who did his brother take the title from? A guy that was a wrestler. It all looks like it's being made by the gods. Eve Landu goes to 18 and 9. And he won over. Made some new fans here in Milan tonight. So we move on to the straw weights. Beastie Barbie, Kiara Penko. We saw her before. She has been impressive inside the Bellator cage. And now set to make her way to the cage, Manuela, the butcher's daughter, Marcaneto. To make her way, Kiara Beastie Barbie Penko. The 
Sauvignon, Italy, the Port City in Tuscany. I like to play a game which is where in the world has John not been? <laughs> that is not on the list, because I know you've been there. Very creative grappler and submission fighter. We check out the tail today. We don't get to see the straw weights very much. Very simply, Popenko has more experience, seven and three, compared to three and one for Mark Cadetto. But both of these ladies match up very well. To Michael C. Williams. Great to see all those tonight joining us in the UK Live on BBC iPlayer as we go now to three five minute rounds in the strawweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot four, weighing in 115.8 pounds. Her professional record three wins, one loss by way of London, England. She fights out of Torino, Italia, Manuela, the butcher's daughter. Marcanetto. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 115.1 pounds as a professional, seven victories, three defeats, fighting out of Livorno, Italia, presenting Chiara Bisti Barbe Penko. In charge, your referee Blake Grice. Ready? Ready? Fight! With the straw weight, you don't see normally a lot of finishes, but Penko, six of her seven wins have been finishes, five of them submissions. Oh, nice straight right hand Big there. Shot. Nice knee to the body, too. Go trying to sneak, sneak in that lead uppercut. She ate a counter right. Every time she throws that right hand, it's been landing. We talk so often about getting hit early in a fight changes the dynamic, but it can change the dynamic for both fighters. When you think that first one lands, all of a sudden you think, oh, maybe I've got her. Maybe I can win differently. I can win fast when you make mistakes. That's true. And you know, it could be the one that wakes up your opponent. So Marconetto's in that position right now. She's been trying to bully her way in. Now she's got her where she's wanted, wanted her against the fence. Let's see what she can do. Marconetto lost her debut, but that was five years ago. She returned to the competitive part of the sport. She's won three straight all this year. Again, talked about the coaching making a huge difference. Boy, Penko is just loading up on that straight right hand. She is just looking for it every time. And when she throws it, she's throwing it with bad intentions. Right in. One of the things that she's doing that you got to look and go, you need to stop. She's starting to hesitate at times. Yep. And when you hesitate, you're lost. Don't hesitate. If you're going to go, go. Circle through, step out, lateral movement, but don't sit there and halfway it and stop. Now, peace out. Now, don't call your own timeout. That out, is exactly what I was going to say. Blake Grace is uh, don't call your own. I call the timeouts right here, not you. And although it seems like bad sportsmanship, if Marquetto had gone after, it's not. Yep. <laughs> the 
Protect yourself at all times. Oh, that Floyd Mayweather knockout. Oh, oh yeah. Victor Ortiz. Victor Ortiz. A friend of mine. Yep. <laughs> and it was like, like, what were you thinking? <laughs> the answer is he wasn't. Exactly. But a big shout out to Victor. Hello, Victor. She's trying to bully her way here. This yeah. is where she wants to fight. So Mark and Arrow showing that this is where she believes that she's strongest in the fight. You see her getting her hands. She's got the double unders. Let's see if she can move Penko to the position she wants or take her to the ground. Got a lot less aggressive as this round went on. Marcadetto took a big shot in the opening seconds of the fight, and as you said, that seemed to wake her up, and she certainly got the better of the exchanges as the round moved on. She did wake up from it, and she, she became much more active, and, and the, the pressing motion was much better as far as she wasn't just coming in, you know, without thinking. Beautiful right hand right there by Marcadetto. Same shot. That was a clean right hand. She just needs to follow through all the way with it. Pinko almost losing her balance. That mouthpiece comes out, don't stop. You keep fighting until I call time, okay? All right. Just so we're clear. Ready? You don't have, you know, Ready? you're not. Fight! Or expulsion down there on the sidelines. Timeout. I don't like the way this is going. <laughs> I need my timeout. Fighters don't get to call timeout. You take a look at those stats there. First round. Marconetto 33 of 102. Penko 13 of 58. Big difference right there. And that's what you were talking about. Once she woke up, look at what happened. And there were purpose to her shots in setting up the scrambles along the fence. Marconetto's taking the center of the cage. To drive Penko backwards and do work from there. Well, the best part that you've seen out of Marconetto right now is she's the one that's initiating those exchanges, and Penko tries to counter, but then you also see Marconetto counter that counter, which is smart, and she's throwing more than just ones, ones, twos. She's actually throwing those three, fours, and fives. Penko now is eating one every time she goes in, which is making her hesitant. Take a yep. look at her. The, the faint to jab combination uh, ratio for Penko has increased oh, immensely throughout this. She's gaining confidence because she's landing. She can feel it. And she realizes that Penko is having problems when she counters again. Right there, straight yep. shot. It's not that Penko didn't touch her, but there was nothing on the end of that shot. like to see out of Marconetto is when she throws, 
She keeps on throwing that one, two, and then she'll throw a straight left. Think about bringing that down to the body. Quit head hunting so much. Give her more to think about. The last exchange, Penko just threw a knee in there, which at least was something a little different. We're going to throw that one, two, one, two up, and then three to the body. It'll be there for you. Always fascinating sometimes, and this crowd has been really loud throughout the prelims, but sometimes you can hear the coaches changing on the fly, barking out different instructions. I don't think in the second round Penko has set foot inside the what I'd call the inner circle of the cage. What does that tell you? No, no, I mean, is exactly it. But, and she's trying to sharpshoot from her position, and it's just not getting there. It's not reaching. And so you've got to move your feet. Use your feet to get inside to land your shots and move your feet to get out. Don't just lean towards going forward and then lean back. Penko is all one and done here. Be too stubborn when something isn't working. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. There's no doubt about it. Loaded question. Yeah, I mean, you look and you go, sometimes you got to realize, and sometimes it's hard to realize that I'm not being as effective as I think I am. And with the, just the lack of output, really, because she's waiting, 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 it's always Marconetto who's the one that's initiating for the most part. Every now and then, Pinko will, but Marconetto. 80% you know, of the time is the one initiating and the one closing off on those shots. You gotta, you gotta be able to feel that and say, I need to get busier or I need to be more successful with the shots that I'm landing. Takes back the center of the cage again. She has kept Penko at bay in every possible way. Again. Petko has not been able okay. to get inside after that first shot in the opening round, and now she have to. You ready? Ready? Back, 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 fight! <laughs> Referees are so demanding. You turn, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think both ladies need to switch what they've been doing. Marconetto needs to become a little bit more complete quit being such a boxer in this and start to use those kicks start to use some of that grappling that she even put her against the cage with and take her down with make her think more about more than just your hands right now and penko 
Penko really needs to open up. She needs to get after putting Marconero on her back foot. She hasn't been able to back her up at all in this fight. It's made a huge difference. Take a look at those punch stats, Sean. Very similar in both rounds. Yeah, very much. Uh, those are total strikes landed now. Double the strikes landed right now by Marconero. Marconero has countered, and she has defended extremely well, but she hasn't really gone on offense. See, nice face, but everything she throws is to the head. I mean, I can't remember the last time she went to the body. And she's got kicks available, doesn't throw any of them. She is, she's limited herself to being a boxer inside a mixed martial arts cage, which, hey, it can work, but you're making it easier on your opponent than you have to. If I only have two things to worry about, being a left hand and a right hand, that's a lot easier than basically the 14 tools that you have to use against me. We've seen one knee thrown in this fight. We haven't seen a kick thrown. We haven't really seen a takedown attempt. Saw some work from Marconetto along the fence late in round one. Good pressure, nice job. See, that, that's what Penko needs. Go back at her. Force her back. Put her on her back foot. And when you're facing somebody that doesn't want to go back, the way to make them go back, you got to throw shots. You got to score and force them into that feeling of, I've got to go back to get away from this. do get the feeling one well-placed kick to change the entire dynamic here. Penko has used a couple of kicks throughout the fight, but not that much. Both of these women have basically decided we're going to be boxers in here. We're going to use our hands and we're going to try to you know, hurt our opponent or damage our opponent with those shots. Not an easy thing to do all the time. Penko's success has come on the ground in her career. Yeah. And how many times has she tried to take this fight down? It's more puzzling with Penko with a fighter who's had success fighting other ways. So much she stubbornly stared to an now, aim plan that is not being successful during the rounds. That was sort of a half-hearted attempt. Anything to change it up instead of just eating counter shots. Stayed on the feet and she has paid the price throughout these 15 minutes. A lot of times when she gets inside and she's throwing her shots, her chin is going up in the air. So when Marquetto is hitting her, it's having an effect. To the finish line. The only moment of the fight that separated that was when the mouthpiece came out. That was the only moment where it didn't look as if the entire 15 minutes looked exactly the same. Basically, you had that first shot at the beginning of the fight where Marquetta went down, but 
Nice elbow inside. That one really wasn't much, but Marquetto for the most part landed the better shots overall. She kept you know, coming after her. Penko had a couple of shots that landed clean, but it, there you go again, Marquetto coming up, landing three shots, lands two of them. And it's always gonna be that last shot that usually lands with the best effect. Torino, Italy, the site of Bellator's first international show six and a half years ago now. And the Bellator debut of Manuela Marcanello should be a successful one. This night is about two fighters get to fight at home. Some curious decisions made by the fighters in the fight. Let's see how the actual decision goes to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first sell, the model scores at 29 28. He sees the fight for Penko. Your second judge, Michael Bell, scores it 29 28. He sees the fight for Marconetto. Your third and final judge at cage side, Doug Crosby, scores it 30 to 27 for the winner by split decision. Kihara Beastie Parker. All right, that's a wow for me. 30 to 27. Hey. A win is a win for Kiara Penko going to eight and three, four and one in Bellator. And a frustrating decision for Manuela Marconetto. Well, we are going live on Showtime a little over an hour from now. We talked about the co-main event. Saul Rogers and Tim Wilde have to figure out where they stand with that, we talked about the dangling carrot of next year's lightweight World Grand Prix. No spots are guaranteed. You gotta earn your spot. You gotta show out to get the call out to be a part of that group next year and opportunities here all up and down the main card. Well, if you Google the Axe Band, Alfie Davis, you'll see one of the great viral knockouts and how he earned his nickname. Now he has a chance to earn his way back up the ladder at 155. Set now to enter the cage, Tebow GT Guzzi. <laughs> Goody now 35 years old, six fights in the UFC after a promising start to his career. Three years away and reinvented himself, has been on a roll over the last year and a half. He had a great fight in his last fight against Lewis Long, a very tough individual, a guy that was on a roll. Goody is good in the stand-up, but his, his ground game has actually gotten good, too, so he's dangerous everywhere now. And now to make his way, Alfie, the Axeman Davis. Kick seen around the world in 
won an early fight in his career in 2016. You rarely see a knockout come from that. He has also was on a huge roll. Winning his first five, Bellator then had that sort of bizarre draw with Tim Wilde in May. One of those two included that draw. Very few people can throw an axe kick to do damage with it the right way. Andy Hook was the guy that did it all the time at K1. It was so effective. He would just take out your shoulders, hit you on top of the head. Alfie Davis has that ability. But the one thing that Alfie Davis needs to do in this fight is not relax. Don't get into that, oh, I can just touch. He's got to be after him the whole time. Going to be a big night here in Milan at 155. Check out the tail of the tape here. You can take a look at everything going. Gowdy's got 73 inches to 70. Not a big difference, especially when you look at the kicks. He's got to be careful of the kicks, Alfie Davis. But this is going to be a great stand-up war. Until Michael C. Williams. Here at Allianz Cloud, we go now to three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner. At 5'10", weighing in 155.9 pounds. His professional record, 16 wins, 5 defeats from Aix-en-Provence, France. Presenting Thibaut Juti Guti. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner. At 5'11", weighing in 156 pounds, even as a professional. 14 wins, 4 losses, 1 draw. Fighting out of London, England, Alfie, the Axeman Davis. And the referee in charge, Blake Grice. Hang tight, guys. All right, here we go. You ready? Ready? Fight! The awkward one dude doing the handshake. <laughs> well. Good shot. Quick feed to Davis. He's looking to land another one. He's getting loading up on that left leg. Good pressure by Goody, though. Yeah, keeping the distance away. Yeah. He can't throw it. Make it to where those kicks, he's like wanting to throw it. He's trying to gain the distance for it, can't do it. Not a bad game plan by Goody. Stay on Alfie Davis. Close that gap. Take away one of his best weapons. There are so many things about the fight game that are counterintuitive, but that is one to avoid damage, get closer. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> Lean into the damage. That's right. One of the things to look for when you see Alfie Davis switch stance into the southpaw stance, watch for that left leg kick yep. to the body. He loves to bring it towards the liver. How does Alfie Davis create the distance that he needs? That's a good way to do it. <laughs> the easiest way, land clean shots. When a guy's coming at you, after you land several clean shots, they start to always. <laughs> and again, that's Listen, another you fighter. Cannot, you cannot call timeout. Fight until I say stop. I thought we just covered that. Everyone is giving referee Blake Rice problems with this timeout stuff. <laughs> may be something we have to go over in the back with uh, everybody. You have no timeouts remaining. None. It would be a game changer if you did, though. Alfie's open a cut. In the nose, bridging the nose, it looks like. Goody. Yeah, and at first you saw blood on the face of Alfie Davis, but I didn't think that was his. Yeah, it's hard to tell. You can have spinning with an overhand right and then creating the distance. Well, Theobald Gowdy's got a game plan and he is definitely trying to implement it. Yeah, he was coached up. Do not give him distance. Right the body. 
Anthony. Yeah, Davis going low here. Low, low, low. Come over here. Right here, Alfie. Stay right there. No coaching, please, sir. You're good. You got some time if you need it. You ready now? You sure? Okay. What is the purpose? Okay? Time purpose is the wrong word. What is the thought behind no coaching being allowed? Like that. that is not the coach's time. It's unfair as far as the right at that point. It's not the end of the round or anything like that. So when the coach starts to coach his fighter, he's getting an unfair advantage of free access to his fighter. There's no crowd noise, nothing like that. That's not your time. That's the referee's time. You don't get to coach during that time. The coach can coach now, but not during the break. At that time. Alfie really needs to start start really jumping on that jab. Whether he's in southpaw or orthodox stance, really start just sticking it out there. Davis is testing the distance now. Well, he's got a he's got a better feel for it right now. Yeah. Gabby's coming inside, but he's not being able to throw and be effective because he he starts to set his feet to throw. And Alfie Davis is now throwing. Now he's starting to lean back. He's not doing. Notice how his hands are staying in that you know, position. He's being defensive. He's not able to land clean shots on Davis. Fight at 155 coming up later on with the top middleweights in Bellator finally back in the cage. Costello Van Steen is very much looking forward to his return. He's standing by with Amanda. We're back here in the locker room with Costello Van Stienis. Two years since we have seen you. You said you had a lot of bad luck over that time, but here you are tonight. What was it like preparing for tonight and how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling great. Of course, of course. Before a fight, you're always nervous. But I'm actually really relaxed, to be honest. But now I'm feeling the, the heat boil up. So, but I'm, I'm good and prepared, so yeah. You told us earlier this week that you're not just fighting your opponent, you're fighting this entire division. Why is that? I've been, I've been away for two years. And I know two years before when I was in this division, I was the fear of the division. I know nobody wanted to fight me. And now I'm going to prove it again. I'm back after two years. Everybody's going to be scared. I'm, I'm the fear. I'm going to show that Team Musashi is the apex of this whole middleweight division. All right, final question. In a year from now then, you are back. You're sending a message to this entire division. Where do we see you in one year? One year, champion. Champion, that's my spot. Next year. Good luck. Thank you very back much. Me, guys. Stay right there. That's Don't a bad man anymore. right there. And he was on a roll when the bad luck happened and injuries happened. Ready? Ready? Fight! We were spending all this time talking about Fabian Edwards tonight and what may be on there for him. Costello Van Steed has beat him the last time. Though. That's right. The sport is so hard. It can derail you at any moment. Training, all the things that happen. There's that body kick that we were talking about. Alfie Davis when he goes left. Look out. I am, I'm really impressed with the pressure of Theobald Gowdy. He's going after it, but he's got to throw more. And he's got to throw straighter shots. Straight shots down the middle. They're going to get there fast. Might have broken his arm yep. with that shot. Yep. He's, you see him backing away. Yeah. You see the way he's holding it. Yep. He's feeling the click in that arm. If you were to gauge the fight just based on uh, the game plan to keep in the distance, Goody has done that. But now he has obviously suffered damage. And he's still trying to keep Alfie Davis from getting that distance, but now he's got a lot of things to deal with. Notice Alfie is staying in that southpaw. 
because yeah. he wants it. He's gonna go, he's gonna aim for that arm. He's gonna go after it. Notice how much every time you're seeing Alfie Davis give a, a flinch or a feint, you're seeing Theobald Goody is really reacting off of it now. And have we seen Goody do anything with that right arm? Nothing. I've been waiting. Yeah. Not one shot has been thrown. Nope. holding it near his body he's using it to protect that side of his head but he's not throwing it forward yeah, from that moment where we saw that reaction that hand has not moved out towards doing he's, anything offensive towards Alfie Davis. Goody's a one-arm fighter right now. Alfie Davis sort of picking his spots. Uppercut gets in. Goody trying to lead with that left, trying to drive him backwards, take that distance away. And there's the first time he's thrown it. You see him trying to shake that right arm as soon as he threw it. Well, Alfie Davis was setting up that spinning kick for a while. See that perspiration get snapped off of his head with that kick it landed. Goody being very tough. Still, still applying pressure, still going after him. But he's been relegated to being more of a one-sided fighter. Is this the right amount of patience for Alfie Davis, or should he be more aggressive? No, you know, I got to give it to Alfie. He's been very active. He's been throwing nice kicks. He's been actually throwing the kicks to land on the arm, too. And sometimes you'll do that when a guy's got a lot of power in that arm because it makes, makes it to where, you know, loses its effectiveness. But he's been going after. Tab. All right, let's see what, the, yeah, there is the, another giveaway. Let's see what goes on in the corner here of Goody. Keeping an eye on that right arm. The one that is dangling. Right here you'll see nice kick to the body there. Return kick to the leg. One of these was the one right in there. See those shots, he's blocking them with one arm. And many times we'll talk about that Dutch block where you want to take and you want to bring your other hand to just take a lot of the snap off that kick. Every time you take a kick with one arm, there is a solid chance that that kick has the ability to break one of the bones in the arm. It might have happened. Frank Shamrock fought Kung Lee. What explain to people what Blake Rice just had Goody do. 
He had him move his arm, push his arm in different directions to see, can you defend go, yourself ready? with it? Ready? Right now he Fight. can, and that's why he's allowed to go on. If Blake Grice sees any type of displacement in that arm, he's going to call this fight. But right now, you look, there is no displacement. It could be that there's a fracture there. But if he wants to continue on, since you can't tell for sure that it's broken, he, he's going to let him go on. He moved the arm the way he, he asked him. That's all he can do. There he tried to use it. And it's one of the things, that if you're Alfie Davis, many times you'll get a guy that doesn't use his arm, doesn't, and you'll get lulled into that, and all of a sudden it pops out there. you got to be careful. Always be expecting it to be used. Always be expecting it to come your way. He's using it now. He's well, throwing it more. He didn't throw it at all in the final four minutes of the second round. And watch Alfie Davis switching stances. I'll tell you what, Theobald Gulley has taken so many of those kicks that we were, I was talking about to the body. He has just handled them well because you can see his whole right side is pink. This is a gutsy performance. And a well coached one also from the start. The game plan was to take the distance away from Alfie Davis, and he's largely done that. Even while being hampered, particularly in round two. Going to be a lot of bruising on that right side and that lat. You can see it now. Tomorrow it's going to look special. And a lot of what you're seeing out of Goody is exactly what Tim Wild tried to do with Alfie Davis. Used a lot of footwork, a lot of pressure to put him in bad positions, take away his kicks, and he was successful. Anyway, Goody has just kept coming forward, even with that disparity. You see the number of shots he has taken. And you can look at those strike stats as far as that's, that's basically landed almost three to one. Goody at Fox Stage North Cup. Six fights in the UFC. And three years away, unbeaten in his four fights since coming back last year. He needs a Hail Mary now. Davis still still very respectful yeah, of the power. And it's one of the one of the things you'll see out of Alfie Wick, you know, he's a he's a great stand-up fighter, but he will raise his chin. Watch how many times when he's throwing that chin starts coming because he's trying to lean out of the way. You're better to roll your head forward, bring your head into a forward position, roll through than you are to ever lift that chin up and lean back. You see, even as a Largely one-armed fighter, you can see that Goody has done damage here. Oh, no doubt. And in this round, he's used that right arm effectively multiple times. This has probably been Goody's best round. with Alfie Davis as far as his patience, his maturity. Because when you hit a guy as many times as he has hit Goody and he's still there, it's frustrating. It's like, man, how much more do I have to do? How many more times do I have to hit this guy? What is this guy made of? And just continue on with what you're doing. That's part of the maturity of being a smart fighter. You're not going to put everybody away. 
Alfie Davis trying to empty the bag here in the final seconds. Landed a lot of shots on the veteran. Moody kept going forward all the way to the finish. That was good stuff. A lot of hard showing by Theobald Goody. A lot of guys could have walked themselves out of that, have an injury, probably a fracture of the arm. Stayed in there, stayed tough, fought all the way to the end. What did you make of the fact that he used the right a lot more in the third round after not using it all in the second? You know, a lot of times it's just that you have the fracture and it can actually settle and you'll actually feel it click. And you'll get this clicking back and forth. And I know that sounds weird and nasty, but it all of a sudden it'll settle into where it's not as bad when you throw it. Sounds as if you're speaking happened. from a place of experience yeah. that people would not want to experience. You don't want the experience. It's not a good one. Nice shot right there by Alfie Davis. He was able to land that left hand continuously. It was his work from the southpaw position where he did the best work, most damage, and I think that's when he ended up actually hurting the arm of his opponent. Goody did a great job staying tough in the fight, but should be a good win for Alfie Davis. Michael C. Williams has the official word. Ladies and gentlemen, from your judges' scorecards, all three, Sal D'Amato, Michael Bell, Brian Miner, have it exactly the same, 30-27. All for the winner by unanimous decision, Alfie the Axeman Davis. Alfie Davis, 6-1-1 one, and one inside the Bellator cage. A very impressive, disciplined performance against the courageous veteran, Debo Goody. We are headed towards the main card. We're going live, top of the hour on Showtime, headed for a fascinating main event, but in the co-main event. All eyes will be on Fabian Edwards, the number two ranked middleweight in Bellator, looking for a signature win that could put him into the title picture, but there is a very tough veteran standing in his Look way in Charlie Ward. There is bad blood between the two. There are high stakes in the co-main event coming up later on tonight. Speaking of 185ers, there was a time when it seemed Costello Van Stetis was destined for a world title shot. Now he's got to get back on the horse and a great chance to do it right now. Ready now to make his way, Camilo Honestro. Camille Loney's Chuck. Very proud of his Polish heritage. He fought primarily at 170, and he's a guy moving up. He is moving up, and look at this guy is rangy. He is awkward sometimes in the way he attacks his fighter, with that and causes his opponent problems because they're not used to seeing the style that he brings. He is super strong, got a big gas tank. This should be a great one. And now set to make his way, the Spaniard, Castello Van Stevens. Turn the clock back, pre-COVID, and it looked like this guy was the next big thing at Middleweight, and he was heavily on track for a world title shot until he got into a fight with John Salter, and like so many people, seemed to underestimate the strengths of John Salter, and suddenly that derailed him. And even with the, the split decision win over Fabian Edwards, that combined with the injury and COVID, in suddenly a very crowded division. As you said, John, that's what hack happened in MMA. It very quickly turned around as we check out the tail of the tape here and another one that could steal the show tonight. Very simply put 13 and two for Costello Vancinas, nine and one for Camille Osnuk. This guy is 
good. This is a fantastic middleweight matchup. To Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here, Bellator 287 will go to the middleweight division. Set now for three five minute rounds, introducing the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 185.4 pounds. His professional record nine wins, one loss, hailing from Medezuc, Poland, presenting Camille Ernesto. And across the cage is adversary out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 185.4 pounds. In his return to the belt court cage, he stands with 13 professional victories, two defeats from Rotterdam, Netherlands, Castello, the Spaniard, Van Steenis. And the referee in charge, Brian Miner. Is Costello Van Stetis ready to regain his place in line at 185? There was a little bit of heat between these two at the weigh-ins. Yeah. On a stroke, decided that pushing Costello Van Stetis seemed like a good idea at the time. Van Stetis just looked at him and said, oh, I see. We'll see you tomorrow. When you have a fighter coming off an injury, you want to see how confident he is, particularly in the lower body. Take a look at that yeah. low calf kick already by Costello Van Stinas. You can see the lump already on the shin of Onestrook. At the bottom of the left leg. Yep. And if we can see it, he can feel it. Beautiful body kick stopped by Gnanstinas, though. And this is where Onestruck does great work. He's super strong inside the clinch. You wouldn't think due to his range and the, and the length of his legs he'd be that effective, but he's really good in there. Brings up really hard knees. Series of misfortunes have hit Costello Van Stinas. He was going to fight Lorenz Larkin last May, he had groin tear, he had hernias, mission towards ACL. And that could happen just when everything is going great. It can turn just that quickly. Still just 30 years old. The Salter fight was the one that derailed him. He had John Salter. He was teeing him up first 60 seconds of that fight. And once John Salter got it to the ground, and Stinas couldn't get back up, and he had a huge third round. There was drama because after Salter had won the first two rounds, Van Stinas was toying with it. There was a we were on that 10-8 surfboard for a while in that third Absolutely. round. Absolutely, he was he was eating John. John took a lot of damage in that third round. It was one of those ones. It could have been a 10-8. There's what being long and lanky will do. You think you got that guy? Good balance by Onestruck to get himself back. This team is going back at that left calf where he did the damage in the opening minute. You can see, take a look as that leg sticks out there. Look at the lump on that front shin section of that calf. That's all due to about, what, three landed calf kicks? And see, there you go. So how's the ability with that trip? You see it, Onestruck trying to get his back to the cage. Quick as he can. Van is going to the back. But a good job by Onestruck. He's not in a bad position. He's got to get his leg free. 
got a baseball grip on the left arm of Van Steenis. The question among many is how is that left leg feeling right now? Not good. Just telling you, that thing is, you can see. Whoa. Big shot. Not expecting that. Rosichuk against the fence to get a kick that high. Noni Chuck said, I've got the best high kick in the division. He's going to get a takedown here. He's got his hands together. He just needs to drive his hips in. Nice job by Stinas yeah. to use the cage. Didn't grab anything, but he used it as a balance point. Scrape. A lot of back and forth. There's a lot of energy being put out by both of these guys right now. All of this grappling and clinch work has not been easy. Just forget not having seen him so long. Out of sight, out of mind, how dominant Van Stevens can be. And how explosive and yeah. dangerous he can be in a short amount of time. Through one. There's the one that left the mark. Those had an early effect, man. You could see. And you can see the damage already on that leg. If Van Steenis goes back to that, one of Stork's gonna have to figure out a way to stop. But you gotta give it to Ona Stork. Had a really good round as far as he was throwing back shots. Did a great job of defending against the takedown. Grab that water. Watch how Onis Chuck comes out in round two. And does he or does he not have issues with that left leg? And just right there, I was watching him look down at his leg. Yeah. So obviously, with two, taking right? a step, he round feels two, it. Stinas right now, very smart. There is no tree so tall that it can't be chopped down. That is the truth. Right and again. But that right there, that right hand you just saw by Van Stinas, that's set up by that calf. Yes, kick. it is. Van Stinas just going after that left calf. Again. And what you're seeing from on a stroke, he's trying to time it. So when Van Steenis throws, he's trying to throw a right hand down the middle. He's just not able to time it right now. Van Steenis is looking at him as far as he keeps on bringing that left hand up every time he throws that kick. But you just saw the kick by on a stroke, nothing on it. High kick, low kick, Van Steenis locked in. Uh, Got to be careful of blocking that with that one hand. How much of your power do you lose when you lose the base like he's lost with that leg? Boy, Not the back leg, so but. much. And you got to really give it, you know, thinking about it as you're looking at it, how long has it been since Van Steenis has stepped foot in the cage? He looks good. We talk about ring rust and things like that all the time. I'm not seeing anything with him. He's been fighting smart. He's effective. We see 
fights you expect to go a certain way, and then a shot lands 10, 15 seconds into it. That completely changes the direction of it. Well, the one thing that you're really seeing, and again, that the calf kick has created in this situation. Nice shot. Beautiful oh, shot by the high kick. Oh. Pat Stetis goes he's hurt. Oh, he's hurt. He's hurt. He needs to change levels, but even that was too slow. Uh, wrapping up the Dars. Autostruck stays there. He's in trouble. It. That's it. Costello Van Stenis, the Spaniard, is back. That was a carving. You talk about a guy that just surgically picked his opponent apart. That was a beautiful performance by Costello Von Stenis. A big calf kick landing, 10, 15 seconds into the fight, turned it and on his chuck. Hung in there. That's a tough kid right there, but this is one of the best in the world, and he looked like he was in prime form. That's six shots in a row that landed, even though he got that glove up on the end there. And then you see him come, latches onto that Dars. And once you're under there on that Dars in that position, it is so tight, there's nothing you can do. Beautifully performed, beautiful transition. Great win for Costello Vanstinas. Who stops a guy who had never been stopped and does it with ease to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the Dars brings on the tap. Official time, three minutes, two seconds. Round number two, the winner by submission, Costello, the Spaniard Vanstinas. That is a statement made by Costello Vanstinas. Number one, gang on me, Johnny Elder. We head to our final prelim as Costello Van Steen is heads to 14 and 2. Skip the rest of you guys. Bellator heats up in Milan. When lightweight contender Adam Piccolotti takes on Bellator newcomer Mansour Barnau. Plus Fabian the Assassin Edwards versus Charlie Relentless Wolf. Bellator MMA Live, today on Showtime. We check out the tail of the tape of the always entertaining TV Gallon. David Gallon at 5'8", 5'10", for Skatizi. Skatizi, an outstanding grappler. But Gallon, black belt in judo, but being very effective on the feet. Gallon has won five straight. Daniel Skatizi, a young fighter. A lot of those losses came early in his career. He talked about that first ever international Bellator event in Torino, Italy back in 2016. Because he's just 23 years old, a very young fighter at his first event on the big stage back in 2016. Uh, the crowd's still buzzing here because there are wins and there are statements. And what we just saw from Costello Van Stenis is, you want to put Fabian Edwards in the co-main event? Fine. <laughs> Let him top that. Hey, and you, you really have to look at that, Sean, because it's so important to these guys I beat that man. Yes, I've been gone. Yes, I was injured. But I want you to know I beat that man. You just saw what I did. Let's see him do something better. That's a discussion we're going to have tonight as you look at Daniel Scatizzi is what next for Johnny Eblen, the new middleweight world champion, because obviously Gegard Mousasi at some point, if he wants a rematch, I think he's certainly entitled to it. Baby Edwards could write his own ticket tonight. Yep. Costello Van Steen this year. It's, it's pretty interesting at 185 right now. Getting a little more crowded. It's the way you want it. Hey, 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 let's go. To Michael C. Williams. Tonight we'll conclude with the prelims here at 287 with three five-minute rounds and the lightweight division introducing the blue corner at five foot ten weighing in 154.8 pounds his professional record 11 wins six losses fighting out of dublin ireland by way of roma italia Daniele scott scapizzi 
and across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.8 pounds as a professional. 21 wins, seven defeats, two draws from Normandy, France, Davy Le Normand charge Jacob Montalvo. Bob, are you ready? Are you ready? Slide. This is the most efficient promotion in MMA, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Fast. We put off fights. No one's here for that fluff. Let's fight. I own 3 0 inside Bellator. He's won five straight. Now, oh, we we'll get a chance to get nice. this out. Very nice yeah. attack by Scatizzi. Trying to neutralize. Now, watch Guy on here. His back, well, he's not going to work around his background, which is judo, because his back looks like it's about to be on the mat. There he goes. He's a high level judo player. But you saw Scatizzi get those hands clasped around the hips. He had the ability to elevate Guy on. Once you got someone around the, the base of that you know, hip area, very difficult for them to stay on their feet. It's easy has the judo background too, not at the same level. Now, but Skatizzi on the ground, he is very skilled. Stuck his arm on the wrong side. He's going to have to get his arm on the other side of David Gallon. There he does. Job by David Go. Himself back to his feet. Right back in on the hips. Scatizzi is the only fighter won that fight in Torino in 2016. And when he was in the cage, he had some issues with the translator when he was using a certain language to describe some of his attributes that she was apprehensive to translate. <laughs> well, as we say, lost in translation. That, that right there hurt. Win that scramble, yeah. Yeah, well, it was just slipped by Scatizzi. His foot slipped out on the canvas. That's what ended up putting him there. He's got to work his way back to his feet or try to get into a position for a submission here. He likes to stay on his back at times. This is not against David Gallon. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to be the man on top. Come out strong. This would be the biggest win for Scatizzi in his career. No doubt about it. David Gaon has been on a roll. He has been just lighting people up. He's been winning in the stand up, winning on the ground. He had that rolling thunder kick yeah. against Ross Pearson. It was just unbelievable. Do you find younger fighters now who've come up in the YouTube age? Think more about that viral moment the same way kids now are all shooting three pointers, right? Yeah, you know, it really would. If they are so much more apt to try the things that we would never try before. Yep. Two judokas walk into a phone booth. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, that was a that was a nice Uchimata attempt by David Gaione. He had that leg up high. Tell people what that is. And Uchimata, you, any, the easiest way for you to think about it when you're to remember it, that leg comes up between your opponent's legs, and that's why we go Uchi because it's kind of you put it in a place where it doesn't feel too good. That was probably not the explanation. Why do you probably think? not? That's why I want. <laughs> Do it right there. He's looking for a harder gosh.
And that, this is one thing when you're working against David Goan, if you notice, look at all the foot attacks, a lot of foot sweeps, just little things to upset your balance all the time. They had, they start to take an effect on you because you're not sure where the next attack, where your, ba your balance point should be. Finishes strong. the main card, top of the hour. Open with Justin Gonzalez at 13 and one. Trying to make a statement. Bone lost to Aaron Pico. The two magicians that know each other's tricks. That's round what we guys. saw in round one. Fight. Who took their judo into a great MMA career? Obviously, Ronda's the first one that comes to mind. Toss to Toshi Ishii and Bellator. Give me some of the great judokas that made it work. Well, you know, the first guy ever that we saw was a guy named Christoph Leninger. And he came in and had good judo. Ben Spikers tried it, you know, when he fought Henzo Gracie. But if you're going to look at Yoshida in pride, really made a career with his judo, being an Olympic gold medalist. A couple of guys, Nagawa, he was an Olympic gold medalist. Wasn't as successful in the MMA realm, but if you're going to say who is the most successful judoka overall, it's got to be Ronda Rousey. We often didn't have much time to appreciate it in her fights. Well, now you take a look at it. the person who is doing it now. That's Kayla Harrison. Yeah. Still remains the area where the most things are happening that you don't necessarily appreciate is these little exchanges along the fence. So much goes on in these clean situations that you're seeing and that struggle for the underhooks that you're looking at right now. Scatizzi looking to drop those leg, those arms down, change levels, get into that possible double leg. And everything is about leverage here. You dig that underhook, you keep it high, you push your opponents back towards the cage. It's is also at SPG now. Yeah, he's become a much that, yeah, better fighter. A more professional, yes. polished fighter. Exactly. And that, that's really, it's not that he hasn't had some losses off of it, but he's a more complete way. He was a straight grappler before. It was almost scary at times to watch him in the stand-up with what he would throw and how he would throw it. Now, much more polished. Still, still, still has some attacks that you go, you're a little bit off balance there, a little bit out of position, but hey. He used to be way out. He was wild. Oh, yeah. And he, is, he has been, uh, you know, polished down by SBG. See, it's right there. Crushed his space before throwing his hands. And that's just, you know, part of learning the stand-up game. Distance range will wow. get you where you want to be. Understanding when to throw. That timing, that all creates speed and accuracy. That was, 
sweet. That was David Gagnon using what Scatizzi was trying to do, using it against him. That's a judoka right there, using yeah. leverage yep. into the body lock. This is going to be a tough spot for Scatizzi to get out of with just a little over a minute left in the round. Well, knowing that Scatizzi is really good on the ground, he's going to have some good defense. If you're David Gagnon, you want to open up with shots now. Just start to try to do damage to him. Make him pay for the mistake he made in trying to take you down. He's already broken the body. Nice line. job. He goes that top position. We'll see what he does here. Full guard. That was not smart where he put himself. Yeah, he put his head in a dangerous spot. And when you see him going over, that's telling you it was tight. He was having a problem with the pressure. There's no way Scatizzi's doing this two years ago, three years ago. No. This is a different fighter right now. That was a situation in which Guyon could have frozen the round for the final two minutes instead. Now he's on the defensive. Yep. That's Scatizzi, boy, he is finishing rounds strong. This is good stuff. Oh, it is. It's easy. Both guys going after it. Loving it. How are you looking at a round two as a judge? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. There was a lot of good shots landed by both guys. You're looking at the throw. But you're also then looking at the reason that that reversal happened was that. He was tight. That's the only reason. You know it was tight, so it's got to go. And, you know, it, going back, I got to go Skatizzi. Tough round. Now you're in one of those uncomfortable. He could be up 2 0. Yes. Maybe not. Like, we don't know. Skatizzi having fun out there. He, he has been from the time he walked through the through the curtain. All right, round three, fight. tz has been more willing to stand. Almost as if where Guyon felt his advantage was going to be, he's been neutralized. Guyon again almost able to upset that balance, get that leg up high. He gets himself back to a base. He's doing a great job of lacing the one arm of David Guyon. You see him with that body lock, but he's also holding on to the right arm. Keep that grip, then, Eddie. Keep that grip. Right knee in the middle. Right so over here. Here is coach. Yep. Keep that grip. They're right. Use the knee. He basically eliminated him to a one arm fighter at this point. You have the grip here. Shots with the left hand as well. If you feel. Confish, confish, confish. Stand, show, show. Left hand. Confish, confish. Back down. Count the hand. Puts the head down. Do it again. See the effort. Okay. If he can just keep that lace with his right arm, he can decide when to let go with his left <laughs> and land shots. <laughs> Five fight winning streak for Guyon. As you said, he has stayed busy. He has lost fights, but he's getting better and better and better. This is without question is the best performance you've seen. Absolutely the best performance I've ever seen. And again, Guyon almost being able to get him onto his back. Skatizzi fighting his way out of it. 
Still with the double unders. <laughs> you look at this. When you're with Skatizi's arms, you want those either drop them down towards that waistline or bring them up high and make those arms of Dave Guyon go up. That will help you with the takedown. Being in the middle of his back is the hardest place for you to have those double unders and be successful. No one's in a bad spot here because the takedown from Skatizi could basically end it. Knee the legs, foot stump to score. Yeah. Positive reinforcement. Yeah. But you got to look, and if you're Skatizi, you need to do something with this because you're the guy with the advantage, and if you're not going to do something with that advantage, this is about fighting, it's not about running the clock. Right now, he's turned into more of, I'm going to run the clock. Now he's trying for the takedown. That's what you're looking for. He said so much happens in this moment right here. In the fight when he's up for glass. Countdown. Who's going to get the final takedown? Again, look at that underhook. You see how he's driving up and turning that corner with that underhook. That's what puts David Gaillon's back to the cage. Nice turn in. And you just anticipated that's what was going to happen since Katizia had tried multiple times and wasn't able to get there. Guy on my opinion, 30 seconds, you need to go. Don't just hold, go after him. Remember, Skatizi finished each of the first two rounds with a huge flurry. Guy on seems content to run out the clock. And another finishing flurry. Big shots by Gaon now. Good stuff and a great performance from a young fighter, the likes of which we had not seen from him. <laughs> this is very much one of those, your guess is as good as mine. You feel like it went a certain way, yeah. but it's all based on what your expectations were for the fight. And I guarantee you, David Gaon's corner felt he won the fight. Even if we may have seen it differently. It's a close one. But that group knows that that's the best fight that their young fighter has had in his career. Your guess is as good as ours. We're asking all the questions. Michael C. Williams about to give us the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we go to your three judges, Doug Crosby, Michael Bell, Sal D'Amato, all have it the same, 29 to 28, for the Winnipeg Hugh and Hannah, this decision, Daniele. A signature win for a young fighter, and he earned it against the veteran, Davey Guyon. Daniel Scatizzi moves to 12-6, and six, increases his local fan base.
We are going live. Top of the hour on Showtime with the main card. All roads leading now to a co-main event with Fabian Edwards and Charlie Ward. Maybe a middleweight title shot on the line. And, of course, Adam Piccolotti and Mansoor Barnawi in the main event. Top of the hour on Showtime. Bellator heats up in Milan. When lightweight contender Adam Piccolotti takes on Bellator newcomer Mansoor Barnawi. Plus Fabian the Assassin Edwards versus Charlie Relentless Wolf. Oh, nice knee. Final seconds of the round. Big swing and a miss. Oh, my goodness. And it's all over. Just like that. Charlie Ward. He was cut. He was hurt. And, man, he uncorked a shot that dropped Redmond. 